Good morning, everybody. So Aaron mentioned something very important, not paid, not polished. We're going to remember those two things and we're going to get through this. Um, but in all sincerity, I am super humbled and, and, and honored to be able to share with everybody this morning. Um, we are so grateful that you're with us. And uh, we are picking back up on our Matthew series. So we started this series about a year ago. Uh, it was summer of 2021. And we're bringing it back this summer of 22. Maybe we'll finish it in summer of 23. Uh, but uh, just a little bit of context before we jump in and read today's scripture. So Matthew uh, himself was a Jewish follower of Jesus. He He's believed to be the tax collector that Jesus called and said, hey, hey, follow me in Matthew chapter 9. So he wrote this account of Jesus's life and the events of his life from this first person perspective, and he predominantly wrote it to a Jewish audience. So that's going to be important as we walk through the, the scripture today of remembering Matthew himself was Jewish. He was actually uh, very focused on connecting Old Testament prophecies to the events of Jesus's life. In fact, he actually connected about 160 uh, Old Testament prophecies in his account of Jesus' life. So he, this is kind of his, his lens, his focus of, of where we're picking up. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, and we're going to read today's scripture in Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 21. It says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, what did he say? Here it is. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless." For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for your word. Lord, we're so grateful for your spirit this morning moving among us as we got to worship you, Lord, and, and declare these truths of, of who you say you are in your word, Lord, as, as we meet with you and as you reveal these truths to us, Jesus. We just praise you for that. And Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, Lord, you would soften our hearts, and you would help us just to see where we fall into this story. Um, and Lord, we just pray for truth. We pray for, for uh, openness and honesty and, and, and just an honest evaluation of where we are. Jesus, we love you. We welcome you. And we're grateful that you're already with us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, cool. So that was a lot of scripture, 21 verses. Um, and we're going to unpack this. We're going to walk through this a bit today. So in this story, Jesus has already performed some of his public miracles. He's already begun his ministry. Um, and he's, he's kind of in the middle of his ministry where we pick up in Matthew uh, chapter 12. So he and his, his disciples, they're going for a walk. And I like to picture it about 75 degrees, partly cloudy, slight breeze, maybe some butterflies, a little bird. Uh, and, and, and you may be thinking, Scott, with that description, you surely have been to Israel. And I would tell you, I actually haven't been to Israel, um, but I do know from this text, the disciples, they're walking and they're just kind of, you know, running their hands through this tall wheat grass. Um, I get this picture of like a, a child just running free and, and kind of like a, like a picture, you can see this to a picture to a movie. So the kid's just running and their hands are just hitting the tall grass and it's just this really peaceful moment. And that's kind of how I envision this section of scripture with where we pick up. Everything's good. Everything's perfect. Jesus' disciples, they're just hanging out in the presence of, of, of their teacher teacher of their Lord, of their Savior, and they're at peace, and they're just going for a nice walk, and that's, that's where we pick up. But we get to verse 2, and things start to change a little bit. So it says, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. 
At this point, the pleasant walk just may be over. Um, so, you know, the disciples, they're hungry. It says they're hungry, so they were walking, they're having a little snack, they're eating some wheat heads. Um, and then the Pharisees come up and they question them. So, who are the Pharisees? These were some of the leaders of the day. They were very, very focused on right and wrong, on do and don't, on the law, which basically was what God gave through Moses, um, as, as a way to establish the nation of Israel. Hey, these are, these are the rules to live by. I'm God. I know what's good for you. Do these things and it'll be fine. There was just one problem with the law, and it's that nobody could fulfill it, uh, and that, that's part of the reason that, that Jesus came. So the Pharisees were so focused on, on yes and no and, and, you know, do and don't and all these rules, they're following Jesus around on the Sabbath, and they're saying, why are your boys doing what's not lawful? So I can almost just picture them like they're kind of sneering, maybe have their arms crossed. I can't really frown because I'm happy right now, but you know, they're, they're scowling. Jesus, what are your boys doing? What are they doing? Um, so, you know, we need to unpack why were they upset? What were these people so upset about in the first place? So it just so happens that this day that Jesus and his boys are going for a walk was the Sabbath. Um, and the Sabbath was part of what God commanded the nation of Israel to have a day of rest. Um, so this was to do no regular work. It was to come be in God's presence, worship him, give an offering at the altar, just receive from God. So this was part of the Sabbath commandment. Um, God gave this example when he created the earth and everything in it in six days. Uh, and on the seventh day, he rested. We read that in Genesis chapter 2. So God did this not because he was sleepy, but because it's good for us to have a Sabbath. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about what that looks like for those of us who are not under the law but are under grace, check out the teachings that Bryce has done on the Jubilee website. So you may have noticed the word regular, as I described, no regular work on the Sabbath. So we kind of need to ask ourselves, would picking grain have been regular work that the disciples were doing? Were they harvesters? Were they farmers? Was picking grain regular work? Um, and we know from reading the text that no, that wouldn't have been. They were mostly fishermen. We had a tax collector thrown in there, Matthew himself. Uh, and so this wouldn't have been part of the regular work. So that's not the issue. The issue is God also had this regulation on the Sabbath uh, where, where the, the Israelites could not walk more than 2,000 cubits in a day, and I assume everybody is up to speed on the cubit to feet conversion uh, in the room, but just in case you're not, that's basically three quarters of a mile, so three laps around a high school track. Guys, you have to rest. Don't take more than three laps around the track. And so, if, if this is the issue, if the disciples were in violation of this walking too far, more than three quarters of a mile, to walk through this field, we kind of have to ask ourselves, well, what, what about the Pharisees? So they also were coming from the same town. Would they have been in violation of the law that they so firmly upheld? Um, and that's really, that's my take on this, is that that, that was the quote-unquote issue, is that they were more than 2,000 cubits away. So the Pharisees would have also been in violation of this same rule. I think it's important to note here, again, the Pharisees were very focused on right and wrong and do and don't and, and yes and no and this black and white understanding of what God was. Uh, and, and they themselves were willing to violate this rule to follow Jesus. So if they were so focused on the rule, what would have caused them to say, you know what, we're going to follow Jesus and we're going to ask him a bunch of questions in a wheat field? Um, and I, I really feel that that answer is that they felt threatened by his teachings. They felt threatened by his, his, his revolutionary teachings. Scott Marks did a fantastic job last, last Sunday talking about how Jesus expanded the boundaries of the kingdom of God and how he was, he was pushing boundaries and pushing the kingdom and he was challenging the, the culture and the customs. Um, and, and they felt a challenge to their way of life. They, they felt, the Pharisees felt, if I can just do enough good, and if I can avoid enough bad, and if I can make myself look really good in front of other people, I'm going to win God's favor, and I'm going to be acceptable in God's sight. And guys, that's just, that's just not true. Um, I, have, I have fallen into that same kind of thought, and I've, I've felt like I have to clean myself up before I can pray or before I can lift my hands and worship. I have, to, I have to make myself clean before I can be acceptable in God's family. And if, if you've thought that, if you've been taught that, that's just not true. That's, that's part of the picture of grace, part of what Jesus did when he came uh, and, and began to teach and usher in the kingdom of God. So in Matthew 12, 14, uh, it says, then the Pharisees called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. So in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 12, they're just asking him a question. Jesus, what are your boys doing? Why are they plucking grain on the Sabbath? Why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And in the span of 12 verses by chapter 14 of the same chapter, they're ready to kill him. Um, so in one chapter, we go from innocent question to let's commit murder. Let's destroy this guy at any and all costs. And again, I think this is just from 
from this, this notion of we have to stop what Jesus is doing. This was the Pharisee's heart. We have to stop what he's doing, stop the spread of this kingdom. Um, and some of the issue that they were having is Jesus would come and he would go to the Gentiles who were non-Jews. He would go to the, the tax collectors who would rob people for their own, own wealth and benefit. They would go to the, the prostitutes who were selling their bodies. They would go to all these people uh, that, that the, the, the Jews of the time just, just looked down upon. Jesus was, was just breaking so many barriers and spreading his, his kingdom to everybody. And, and that is the invitation that we have this morning. So Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So we're picking up from the Pharisees asking Jesus here in verse 2, hey, what are your boys doing? Why are they doing what's not lawful? And I just, I've noticed that sometimes Jesus gives a straightforward answer, and sometimes we don't like that answer. And then other times he gives this kind of roundabout answer, and we're like, Jesus, I wish you would just say the, the, the real thing here. So what he does is he doesn't provide a simple answer in this context. He comes back at them with questions, and he says, have you not read, in verse 3, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Um, so remember for me that Matthew was Jewish. He was writing to a Jewish audience. They would have been very familiar with King David's actions. They were running from King Saul, trying to kill David and his men, and they were really, really hungry on the brink of death. They went into the temple. They ate some bread. It wasn't lawful for them to do. So I can almost just picture the Pharisee saying, sure, sure, you know, we know about David, but hey, hey, wait a second. I'm asking you questions. Why are you asking me questions now? So it, Jesus is kind of turning the, the conversation on them. Um, and so continuing on in verse 5, Jesus says, or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? So what's he talking about here? Um, the priests would have been doing their regular work on the Sabbath as people came to worship God. So they would have been, uh, you know, performing sacrifices. They would have been uh, taking offerings, helping people worship. So they were doing their regular work on the Sabbath, and Jesus is saying, uh, hey, th there's an allowance for this here. He's actually saying that they've profaned the Sabbath, but on the same sentence, he's calling them guiltless. So I, I, I can picture, I have a pretty vivid imagination, but that the Britney Spears meme where she's like, what, what, you guys know that one? Cool. Awesome. For those of you who are watching at home, there were crickets in the audience, and that's fine. Uh, so they're just kind of like, Jesus, what are you talking about here? They're, they're starting to get confused. You're calling them, you know, they're profaning the Sabbath, but they're, but they're guiltless. What are you talking about? Why are you asking me all these questions? So, Verse 6, Jesus is really getting rolling with his, with his answer here. So he's, he's getting ready to tell the Pharisees, you guys are actually in the wrong because you don't understand what God wants for you or, or from you. You have this, this incomplete understanding of, of what God's doing. Um, so verse 6 says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. So at this point, we have that confused look to like angry. And I think this is what is part of the Pharisees saying, we have to destroy this guy at all costs. We have to stop this teaching. He is, he's profaning the, he's, he's, pro, he's, he's, he's violating everything we know about God. He's telling us we can't just do these right and wrongs. And, 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 and what do we do with him? We have to kill him. Um, so Jesus is, is saying in this that something greater than the temple is here. This is really his mic drop moment. He's getting ready to say, listen, I am in the right. You guys are in the wrong. I have authority. I am actually the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, and and what, he's, what he's doing is he's, he's pointing out the Pharisees' thinking. He's pointing out their, their false thinking. Um, and, and he does that. That's kind of how God communicates to us a lot of times. Um, and D.A. Carson's comment on the book of Matthew, he concludes that the something greater that Jesus is referring to in verse 6 is referring to both the kingdom of God that Jesus came to usher in and also, what else was it? I'm so sorry. He's referring to both Jesus and the kingdom of God. So Jesus does point to his body as a temple in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. So Jesus is basically saying, hey, my, the, the spirit of God, the physical presence of God is in me. So I am the temple that is coming on, on earth. Um, and so God is, is saying in the form of man, he's here walking in front of the people. And the Pharisees completely miss what he's doing because they're so focused on, on yes and no and right and wrong that they actually miss God himself. Hebrews 4.14 refers to Jesus as the high priest who has ascended into heaven. Um, and so I, I love this picture because as priest, 
Priests would have been the ones that were working in the temple. They're the ones that are, that are taking the sacrifice, that are bringing reconciliation between people and God. And here Jesus is saying, hey, listen, I'm both priest and temple. This is the something greater that Jesus is referring to. He's, he's the whole picture. Um, in Revelation 22, 13, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Hebrews 12, 2 calls Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is saying in this sentence that something greater than the temple is here, that, that I'm, I'm the whole deal. Jesus alone is the answer to our sin and our separation from God. Um, and this is, this is what he's, he's telling the Pharisees in his, in his, his responses to them. He's, he's creating something new, a new understanding of, of, of God, and he's, he's speaking to them in a language they'll understand. He's speaking to their hearts beyond their, their actions. He's speaking to them on the inside. Um, and I just want to point out that's the exact same thing that he does with us. Continuing on in verse 7, and if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. So this particular quote that Jesus is pulling in is from Hosea 6.6, 6, which we're going to read in just a second. But what's really cool about this verse is Jesus says the same things to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 9. So in this book of Matthew, he says it twice. Uh, in chapter 9, hey, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then he tells them again in chapter 12, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. You wouldn't be asking me these questions. Um, so Jesus is, is, again, referring to Hosea 6. 6, 6. And what Hosea 6.6 6 is, it says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Um, so to unpack this a little bit, what he's telling the Pharisees, if we think about the Old Testament regulation, and again, the Pharisees would have been very familiar with Jewish law and customs. Uh, the, the audience reading Matthew and hearing Matthew would have been very familiar with Jewish customs. So mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy is directly tied to God's love for us. Mercy is God not treating us as our sin and rebellion deserves. That's what he's saying. I desire this, not sacrifice. If we think about sacrifice, sacrifice in the Old Testament would have been, I have, I have sinned, I've committed this error against my brother, my neighbor, my mom, my dad, whatever the case is, and I'm going to now give an offering to try and make up with this. I'm going sacri- to bring this goat that I could have otherwise, you know, milked or done something with goat hair on. I had this physical belonging that that was a quantitative value. I I could do something with this goat, but now I have to come and bring this as an offering to try and make myself right. Um, And so Jesus saying that that he desires mercy and not sacrifices is really tied to this picture of forgiveness. It's it's tied to this picture of grace. Um, And I think in this, Jesus is just saying that his heart is and always has been one of love and mercy. So even as God disciplines us, it's from a place of love and mercy. He would rather have our love shown through obedience to his word and spirit than our rule following with honor affection. So, yeah. <laughs> it's almost as if uh, Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, guys, you're, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. You're asking me about my disciples. Why are they doing what's not lawful? But what they're doing is they're spending time in my presence. They're going for this walk. They feel safe with me. They feel safe to eat this wheat, even though it's the Sabbath, because they understand that in God's presence, we have freedom. Jesus came to bring reconciliation between God and man. He came to break down that dividing wall of hostility. He came to create something new, and the disciples get this. The Pharisees, they don't know what to do with them. They don't understand this teaching, but the disciples really, really do. So verse 8, I'm getting ready to to wrap up my section here, but verse 8 says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So this is really where Jesus is shutting down that argument. Um, And the the Jews, including the Pharisees, they would have understood this Son of Man comment to be messianic or pointing to the coming Messiah. So for hundreds of years, the the Old Testament folks were, uh, the prophets were pointing to, hey, there's going to be a Redeemer. There's going to be one to come to, to rescue Israel. And this is where Jesus is saying, for the Son of Man, me, the Messiah, is Lord of the Sabbath. He's, he's claiming his authority. He's claiming his lordship. He's claiming the fact that he gets to do what he wants because the day is his. He is God. Um, and, and really, this is where things have, have escalated to the point of the Pharisees saying, we, we, gotta, we gotta get rid of this guy. 
the disciples. I really want us to think through which, which camp are we in this morning? Are we in that camp of disciples of understanding God's grace, of having freedom and going for that pleasant Sunday afternoon walk with Jesus, plucking grain because we're hungry, and feeling safe in God's presence? Or are we in the camp of the Pharisees where we're, we're trying to do yes and no and right and wrong and, and, you know, just polish ourselves up to get right in God's presence? And, and again, the disciples, these are the people that understood grace in this situation. Um, I would just offer that I've, I've been where the Pharisees are, and it, it really is exhausting. They're so focused on their own self-righteousness and trying to catch Jesus that they miss what God is doing right in front of their face. Um, and church, I would just say this morning, if, if you do find yourself in that place of I have to polish myself up and I have to make myself right before God, that's not true. Uh, it's like Scott talked about last Sunday, and, and, and we want people to behave before they belong, I think is what he said. But the reality is, is this understanding of grace, this recognition of what Jesus Jesus has already done for us. That's what gets us into God's family. That's what gets us into God's presence. So if you do find yourself in that place this morning, let's just understand grace. Let's receive that grace that God has for us. It's the desire for mercy and not sacrifice. To end this for you, a couple of verses, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So church, how's your, how's your heart this morning? Do we understand this picture of grace? Do we understand the forgiveness that Jesus came and died to give? Or are we focused on those outward appearances of saying the right things, of praying the right prayers, of looking with, you know, being in front of the right people? Or are we receiving, like the disciples did, this grace and forgiveness that Jesus came to bring us? And with that, I'm going to welcome up my friend David Wright as he continues to unpack the rest of today's scripture. Let's welcome David. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, hi, everyone. For those that don't know me, my name's David Wright. Um, my wife, Emily, and I have been attending Jubilee for around two years now. I just want to thank Scott for that, that message. And uh, part of my own story is a lot of trying to follow rules and earn God's favor um, and his love. And it's just not the reality. It's just such a good reminder of uh, his love for us that we can come freely and receive that. So um, I'm, I'm really humbled and, and grateful for this opportunity this morning as I was on the way in here. I was just thanking the Lord that he uses um, such wicked instruments to actually come and be able to have the privilege to preach his word. Um, and I do take that as a, as a great honor and privilege. So I'll be handling the second portion of our text this morning, um, verses 9 through 21 of Matthew 12. Um, and as, as I was just saying, I think Scott framed those first eight verses really well, showing how Jesus as priest and temple was ushering in the kingdom of God. He showed that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of grace, um, one that is concerned with our heart, not our outward appearance. And I want to pick up this theme in the next few verses and show not only is the kingdom of God a kingdom of grace, but that it's also a kingdom of power. So picking up in verse 9, we see that Jesus went on from this debate with the Pharisees, and he goes straight into their synagogue. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I think this first encounter with the Pharisees probably would have been enough conflict for me for the day. I'd have been like, yep, I'm good. We kind of just had that whole debate out in the field. I'd rather not go straight into their synagogue now and continue teaching. But Jesus was on a mission during his ministry on earth, he was bringing the kingdom of God to bear everywhere he went. In fact, the first time Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 1, verse 15, he says this, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus did not shy away from the hard places, nor was he put off by rejection because he knew the mission he had been given to usher in the kingdom of God. So that leads us to my first point. I'm going to have three points this morning, just kind of uh, structure as we work through these, these 14 or so verses. That as a sent people, we will face rejection as we live on mission. So we live today in an increasingly post-Christian culture where tolerance is the highest virtue in any assertion of one way being the only way, 
to live is the greatest heresy we could ever come up with. So as we share the hope that is within us in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, we will face rejection. It's a reality of the Christian life. But this reality never kept Jesus from his mission. He was fully submitted to the mission God had given him. So jumping back into the passage, Jesus enters into their synagogue, and verse 10 tells us that he's immediately questioned by the Pharisees once again about the Sabbath. This time, it's about whether or not it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath. So I don't know fully from the text if the Pharisees had brought this man with a withered hand, had gone and found him and brought him to the synagogue to set Jesus up, or if there just happened to be a man with a withered hand there and the Pharisees were like, yes, great opportunity to nail Jesus again with another question. Regardless, the Pharisees see this man as just somebody to be used to justify themselves. This was just someone they were using to prove themselves right. The Pharisees didn't care about the state of this man. They had no real compassion or love for this man or his state with this withered hand. He was just a pawn in their game. So as Jesus responds, he flips the question around on them. Scott hit on this well. Jesus flips it around and he starts asking them questions. And it makes them really think about what they're asking as he begins asking them these questions. It helps them see a little bit how maybe hypocritical they're being. So he asks them, how many of you guys have sheep? Sheep, And, uh, you know, probably a lot of them are like, yeah, I've got, I've got sheep. And uh, he goes, all right, well, how many of you, if your sheep fell into a pit on the Sabbath, would pull it out? Most everybody, yeah, 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 I would do that. So, I mean, maybe there's a couple Pharisees that are probably like, no, no I see where you're going with this. I would leave my sheep to die in the pit to maintain my righteousness, Jesus. And he says, okay, I know you guys can't see their heart like I can, but I, I know they're, that's a load of baloney. When, when we're all not looking, they're pulling their sheep out of the pit on the Sabbath. What he's doing, though, is he's, he's letting them see, in this case, you would kind of violate the Sabbath to pull your sheep out because it's of value to you. Then he says, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus is saying you would all pull your sheep out on the Sabbath. And this here is a man made in the image of God. Have you lost all love for your fellow man? Where's your compassion? Do you not remember the words of David in Psalm 8, verses 3 through 8? says this, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. So how is it that the Pharisees could see a sheep as more valuable than a man? Sheep have been placed under the feet of man. And in God's loving kindness, he gave man a position of honor and glory. He shows here that man is of great value to God. And this should have been true, too, of the religious leaders of the day. Jesus steps in and restores the dignity of this man. And in love and compassion, he does good to him. He heals his hand, demonstrating the power of the kingdom of God. He went into the synagogue knowing that he might be rejected, hated for what he was about to do, but he was on a mission to usher in the kingdom of God by power, through compassion. He was on a mission to do good to man. So that leads me to my second point this morning, and that's that the healing power of the kingdom comes through love and compassion. For those of us in the room today that are in Christ, I'm sure you can 
Think back to, to moments where you've seen God's love and compassion towards you and his goodness. Maybe you think back to a moment where he healed you from a deep-rooted sin. Maybe it was a profound wound. You can remember when he was with you as you grieved the loss of a loved one. You can remember times when you just felt completely alone and he was there with you as a friend. We've all experienced this love and compassion. As I was thinking about this in my own life, I grew up as a pretty angry kid. I dealt, a lot, uh, dealt with a lot of anger. I would get in fights all the time in elementary school with my neighbors, like just playing football or playing video games, just the silliest stuff. Anything could set me over the edge and would just always, always get in fights with, with my neighbors. And this one time, I had a pretty bad fight with one of my neighbors at his own house. Um, and it, it was just, you know, at the time, I was like, oh, I'm so strong, I'm so cool. Um, and and I, was just, I was thinking back, like, God carried me through that whole time of my anger. He had love and compassion towards me. He didn't condemn me. He didn't make me feel so terrible about who I was. He said, David, I want to change you in my love and compassion. I want to transform you. So years later, after walking with Jesus through all of this, experiencing his love and compassion, changing my heart, I remember going for a run through the neighborhood in college. I was back home visiting my parents and was going for a run through the neighborhood. And as I'm going through, I'm remembering all these things that God had done in my life. How I used to get in fights in that yard and at that house I got in this fight with this kid. And yet God's changed me now to the man that I am today. And I remember as I was coming back, God put on my heart, you need to go to that neighbor's house. You need to go talk to his parents and apologize to them for what happened 10 years ago or whatever it was. It's just amazing how the love and compassion of God can change us and he can take something that from years ago we didn't even recognize we needed healing and restoration from and he comes in, knocks on the door and then is able to heal us from that. That was a really powerful moment for me. Um, so whatever it is, we've all, we've all seen his goodness. And I, I wanna encourage you that this is the work of God that he's calling us into. That we've been given the Holy Spirit to be partakers in the breaking in of the kingdom of God in others' lives, just as it's broken into our lives. He's healed and restored us so that we could go in compassion as agents of healing and restoration to those around us. Maybe God's saying to some of us this morning that we've been too focused on our sheep in the pit rather than our fellow man. We've been focused on our possessions, our finances, our careers, maybe even our own family, that we've lost that compassion for those around us. And I, wanna, I think he wants to remind us this morning of the great compassion he has for those around us, and that he wants to invite us back into that work, being used by him to heal and restore as we walk in the power of the Spirit through compassion. And yes, as we do this, there will be times where we face rejection. But I want us to be encouraged in verses 14 and 15, as Scott was talking about earlier, Pharisees go from asking him some questions now. In verse 14, they're ready to kill Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't go away and hide. He's not afraid of the rejection of man or what may happen. It says in verse 15 that he goes on healing all who followed him. So he continues on in the mission that God had given him. So like Jesus, our love and compassion for man must be greater than our fear of rejection. I want us to know this morning that we cannot allow rejection of the gospel to keep us from proclamation of the gospel. We cannot allow rejection of the gospel to keep us from proclamation of the gospel. So as we continue into the last five verses in verse 16 through 21, we're going to um, settle on this last point of the morning that the kingdom of God comes also through gentleness and humility. So just before this passage in Matthew 11, verse 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So in verse 15, when Jesus heals this large group of people who are following him, in verse 16, immediately after, he tells them to not go and tell anyone, to not make it known. 
Um, and then in the following verses, it says that this is to fulfill a prophecy that was found in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 3. That's where the quotes in, in verses 17 to 21 are from. It talks about the coming Christ being, number one, a servant. Number two, one chosen and beloved by God. Number three, one who would have the Spirit of God upon him. And number four, one who would proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So first, Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God as its king, but he did so as a servant king. Mark 10, 45 says that Jesus came to serve, not to be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He healed these crowds as an act of love and service, and then he sends them away, not to make it known, because it wasn't for him to become famous. It wasn't for him to be the talk of the town. And this is something we see Continued in verse 19, it says also that the Christ would not quarrel or cry loud in the streets. His voice um, would not be heard in the streets. So Jesus didn't come to make it on Time magazine. Um, he, didn't, he didn't come to receive all the kind of public limelight, have a 60 minutes done on him. That wasn't Jesus' goal. He came as one gentle and lowly in heart with great humility. So this is a quote from, from Matthew Henry that I really enjoyed as I was studying this. He says, those were mistaken who fed themselves with hopes of a pompous savior. He spoke in a still small voice, which was alluring to all, but terrifying to none. He did not affect to make a noise, but came down silently like the dew. What he spoke and did was with the greatest possible humility and self-denial. His kingdom was spiritual and therefore not to be advanced by force or violence, or by high pretensions. No, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. So in humility and self-denial, Jesus heals these people, and then he sends them away, telling them not to make it known what he's done. That leads us into the second thing said of Jesus here. Won't spend too much time on this point, because I think Scott did a really good job of covering it. But it says that he was chosen and beloved by God, and that God was well pleased with him. And because of this, he knew he didn't need to put on a show. He knew he didn't need to earn the approval of man. He didn't need people to all be talking about how great Jesus was because he knew he had the approval of the God of the universe, that he was well pleased with him. I just want to encourage us this morning that we don't have to please our fellow man, that our aim should be to please our Father and know that we have the freedom of knowing he is pleased with us because of what Christ has done for us and us being in Christ. So we don't have to fear the rejection of man. We don't have to live our lives trying to please man. The third thing that we see about the Christ in these verses is that he had the Spirit of God upon him. So we saw earlier the demonstration of the power Jesus had to heal, and it's through the Spirit of God that he receives such power, power to heal, but also power to live as this humble servant. And this is the same Holy Spirit that we have living inside of us. It's the Spirit of God in us that allows us to take the humble posture of a servant like Jesus. The fourth thing said of Jesus is that he came to proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So although Jesus' primary mission here on earth was to the Jews, as Scott was hitting on, especially emphasized here in Matthew, he also came to fulfill the plan for all of history that God had, which was a kingdom composed of every people, every tribe, every language, every nation. So he came proclaiming justice, too, to the Gentiles. And it's through Christ that we, who, most of us, probably not Jewish in here, um, that we're not of the nation of Israel, are now able to be included in the kingdom of God because of what Jesus has done. So that takes us through verse 19. Um, and as we read in verse 20, we see uh, much of the gentleness of Christ revealed to us. It says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. So a reed would have been a tall, thin, kind of grass-like plant. For it to be, have been bruised, it would have been really close to completely breaking. And for a smoldering wick, that would be, you know, a wick that's slowly dying out uh, and doesn't really have much spark left at all. 
And maybe that's how you felt coming in this morning. Maybe you feel like you've just been kind of beaten down by life. Maybe you've experienced some sort of loss recently. Maybe you're, you're just dealing with some, some sort of sin that you feel like just keeps getting you and you're like, I'm about to be just quenched out. I can't, I don't have any power over this. And you just feel defeated. I want you to know that this morning, if you come to Jesus, he will not condemn you. He will not quench the fire that you have left. He will not break you as a bruised reed. He desires to heal and restore you. So I just want to encourage us this morning um, that there's something in our lives that we just, we feel like we need the healing and restoration of Jesus, that we would, we would come and we would receive that. So our passage ends um, with a great hope for those who are in Christ in verses 20 and 21, that one day he will come back again and fully establish his kingdom here on earth when it says, until I bring justice to victory. He will bring about complete justice on the earth. where Every evil is judged and purged from the earth, and all who are in Christ are completely healed and restored for all of eternity. But for those of us who are not in Christ, it's also a solemn warning that when he comes back to judge the earth, we too will be judged and separated from him eternally if we have not placed our hope in the only one who can save us from the evil we've committed. But there is hope for us because Jesus ended this life of gentleness, compassion, humility, and love by putting on display the greatest love the world has ever seen by going to the cross in our place, by taking our sin upon himself that we should have been on that cross. He took our place, demonstrating finally and ultimately his love for us. And he rose again three days later, showing that sin couldn't hold him, death couldn't hold him, that he was victorious, and that in his name we can have hope. So maybe this morning you aren't in Christ. You've never received this hope. Just encourage you that today is a wonderful day to receive Christ. So we're going to end with um, a moment of being able to respond. If that's for you the first time, you, you feel like God's stirring your heart to come and receive Jesus for the first time, or it's just something that is going on in your life that you feel like you need healing, restoration for, you want to begin that process, God's stirring in your heart. We're going to have a time of prayer and response to come forward and receive that. First, um, Aaron is going to give us some instructions for that. Thank you.